bubbles when they pop, what happens emotionally? You're up at the top, you've been riding. What's the process you go through? Well, as Kindleberger, whom you mentioned, uh, wrote about, the, you know, it's, you can't call the moment the bubble will pop. If you could, it would be very easy. But what usually is happening is that you can see what he called, I think he called it stringency, but anyway, a kind of state of mind of anxiety and sort of backaches and things like that, where the market wobbles around a bit. It usually lasts for quite a long period. I mean, you could go, after all, think of uh, summer of 2007 when the current financial crisis began, well, it, you know, in fact, the stock market had all-time highs it's after that. Yeah. It, it took a long time and over a year before we had the real bang. So uh, it, it tends to go up and down where, pe where people try to keep it going because, of course, to recognize the mess that has one got in if one's portfolio is full of things that uh, it shouldn't be full of or et cetera, is quite hard to do. You also have to give up you also have to take the risk that the train's going to go on without you. So there's a lot of forces that prevent people doing it. And the famous Chuck Prince remark about, you know, it we're is. still dancing. Uh, and so when it does happen, what happens is suddenly I think you do get this group feel and it becomes realistic. That is to say, you get panic. And panic is an emotion that spreads very easily. Uh, it, that's how emotions work. They do. They do spread like wildfire. And once, of course, it starts going down, then it becomes self-fulfilling. And these things, the panics tend to happen very quickly, whereas the going up process takes much, much longer because it, is, you know, it goes up with, with occasional yeah. down. It's like the uh, American cartoon, <coughs> The Roadrunner, where the coyote chases the roadrunner and then goes off the cliff, ah, right. stops, yeah. looks around, <laughs> and then falls. And, uh, yeah, exactly. It, uh, exactly. But he always has that moment where he realizes... I'm about to go down uh, yeah, before yeah. it uh, ensues. And of course, it, when it's going down, you can't find anyone around who's telling you that there was anything good about dot coms <laughs> or you know, everyone knows better. And uh, that brings us to one of the other points about it, though, which is that there is a last stage to bubbles, which I think is extremely important. It's the one we're in now, in fact, for the 2008 situation, which is whether or not people are going to learn from it and how they're going to manage the new situation. And this is, I think, there's, I write quite a bit about this in the book, because the typical response is to find people to blame. Now, of course, if there are people to blame, I'm not advocating they should be, uh, you know, not blamed. But blaming forms a function in which other people can put the problem somewhere else uh -huh. and not see that the whole system was involved in it, including ordinary people who maybe joined in in some way, you know. And so... That is a situation which we won't learn from. It's a ritual of sacrifice. Exactly. A little bit like uh, Rene Girard writes on uh, violence and sacrifice. In, uh, it's a very profound thing. And, and, you know, then, but I think it's very unhelpful to really moving on from the situation. In fact, you once told me when you'd been at the Senate uh, uh, banking mm -hmm. thing about how someone said to you, you know, let's find some culprits. We can, <laughs> we can do this quick or we can do this slow. And, <laughs> and you know, we need to do things slowly. And, and I think the, there's still an enormous need, which I write about in the book, for there to be a re-examination by all those involved, regulators and other people, as to really what went on in that period. Because, the, you know, people panicked for a bit. The, the people I spoke to, I've been back and talked with my INET grant, and they panic for a bit, and some of them are still really worrying about it. But others, because the markets went back up, they sort of said, okay, fine, <laughs> off yeah. we go again. Yeah. And this is, if there are fundamental problems, this is not going to uh, help us at all. There'll be another crisis. Let's go back to the scapegoats. People were actually quite relieved when Alan Greenspan said in a congressional hearing before Henry Waxman, I'm, sh I'm shocked my model was wrong. Yeah. They actually gave him a break. They didn't yeah. then make him a further scapegoat. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Whereas other people in the policy framework are still demonized in the blogs and on the news every day. Yeah. So there's still this uh, appetite for blame. Yeah. The other thing is to, is to talk about people who are corrupt and so on. Well, there always are corrupt people. And in a time like that, they're going to be probably more corrupt people. 
and of course they should be punished, etc. But that again, I think, is not the problem. I mean, one of the most interesting cases is Madoff, Mr. Madoff. Mm -hmm who was a crook from the beginning to end. But the interesting thing was a lot of very intelligent, very thoughtful people believed it was possible to do what he was doing <laughs> and took part in it for years. Yeah. And that, that's what I would say, you know, and now of course then they get very angry with him and want to sue him and so on, which is understandable. But in fact, the, their belief that this was possible, that you can keep on winning like that, they weren't investigating sufficiently. There are very few people who've managed that in their lives.